Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Derek Prentisiglio Show. I'm Derek Prentisiglio, but like always, who I am isn't important. It's the guest. And today's guest is the 1998 NASCAR Slim Jim All Pro Series champion. He's also a four time Big Ten Series champion at Concord Motorsport Park. Freddie Query, thank you for joining us. Appreciate yeah. you coming in today. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to know I did something worthwhile enough to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, justify being here. <laughs> you definitely did. Believe me, you are one of the short track legends that uh, everybody uh, talks about in the late model racing world. But uh, what have you been? What have you been up to lately? What have you been doing? Ah, uh, well, myself and guys my age and a little younger, probably age back through maybe where Jack Sprague's at. We've all become very good friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of racing kind of related stuff. I mean, we're playing with go karts. We mess with street cars, hot rods. I build those for other people uh, periodically. Uh, we all have Harley Davidsons. We're into long rides. Uh, okay. Last year we rode up through Maine. We covered 13 states in like eight days, 3,500 miles. Uh, this year the group's going to Sturgis. We're actually leaving next Saturday. I backed out of it. It's just hot, and I just I just some, I decided I didn't want to do it. But we ride. Uh, you know, we'll ride uh, a couple thousand miles a month which takes a little bit of time and then my wife and i were in the, we just got back off a cruise and just uh trying to enjoy life yeah it was when i when i called you last week i think you were on a motorcycle ride somewhere yeah i don't know where you were i think you were in the mountains in tennessee or something yeah, we, like that. We, we were we ended up at the northern tip of west virginia and kind of circled back through uh this thing called the back of the dragon over in virginia mm -hmm. did that and uh, a couple nights out and rode about 500 miles a day that's kind of our norm to do so do you like do you have a plan of where you're going to stay for the night or you just find a place both it depends on the length of the trip okay. uh, one, one of our buddies is a, is a great planner uh by the name of jeff starnes uh and he he will plan trips and where we're going to stay reservations made show up get there you know and, and have a place to stay but but then a lot of times like his last one we just ride and find a place because it depends you may want to go a certain distance and stop or you might want to go a little further or whatever so we don't we're not nailed down to anything and what kind of bike you ride i have an ultra classic harley davidson okay what year a 2014. Okay, nice. nice. Yeah. So what are some of the other bikes of the guys that you're riding with? Uh, kind of the same thing. Some of them ride road glides. Uh, a couple of them have got some newer bikes lately than 14. Uh, 14 was kind of a year that Harley changed over to pretty much what they got now, except for the motor sizes. Mm -hmm. And the Milwaukee eight's the new motor. But okay. uh, but we got the water-cooled head motors and stuff, you know. So it's kind of the newer stuff. Uh, you can find the better deals if you go back. 16 15 14 back in there don't want to go back past 14 because that's when they changed the frame and lots of stuff to make it a more user-friendly bike so you're just living life right now yeah so you know with last well all the years i raced especially there at the end it was so time consuming for my wife and i it took all our time especially our weekends mm -hmm. and uh so a couple of our goals were whenever we parked everything and decided we was going to stay home more we was going to get in a church which we have and that's been good for us uh, but travel more and we're not traveling as much as she wants to yet but uh, we're, we're we're basically doing what we can uh, what we can afford to do mm -hmm. and uh, now when yep. she says travel does she mean like in a plane or on a motorcycle uh, my wife was a flight attendant okay uh, so traveling on a plane to her is not what it would be to some people mm -hmm. uh, it's just a way to get to where you're going not on a motorcycle she's she has ridden with me some but definitely not no long distance anything mm -hmm. uh, try to get her on it more but she just she doesn't enjoy it the way we enjoy it she enjoys the destination we enjoy the ride getting there <laughs> so uh, we're, we're still working on all that but it's uh, it's working out good for everybody my fiance has been busting my chops for a motorhome she wants to go take a motorhome and go across the country and camp yeah. and all that kind of stuff but uh, have you always been into motorcycles even when you were racing uh in, in a smaller way i had bar hoppers that you might call them i built a couple of custom bikes um but I, I, I always had the dream of long rides, and so I had to get a bike to do it on first. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I've come into some friends in the last couple of years that they do that a lot. And so what I've got now is totally not for really riding around town. It's for hitting the road and covering hundreds of miles. Oh, okay. So it's a, it's a different kind of riding than what I've did uh, in the past. But, yeah, we've had motorcycles around for 40 years. Okay, and you're also doing, you're building hot rods too? Street cars, uh, restorations, uh, hot rods for me. I've got, uh, actually I just 
a couple of years ago built another building to kind of we call it a toy barn it's, <laughs> it's, when i get through with projects they kind of go down there and we drive them every now and then but it's always another one going on so uh, what kind of what kind of hot rods you got i've got uh i've got a couple older chevelles that are fixed up i've got several corvettes i've got uh my latest project was an S10 uh, Chevrolet truck that the only thing I used was the cab, built the frame, and it's got a big motor in it. It's got a quick change rear end in it and transmission out of an old race car and, and just a lot of lot of old race car stuff in it. Okay. Uh, that was kind of my goal, but it got out of hand. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure my producer's uh, got a big smile on his face right now because he loves those old Chevelles. Well, yeah. I've, I've, I've got two nice ones. i got a 1967 and a 69, and, mm-hmm. and both of them are nice cars, and... They were, I bought the 69, I was still racing. The 67 I bought afterwards, but they were, back in the day I had them. And then you, then I went through all the years of racing, and basically every penny had to go towards getting to the track next Saturday night. <laughs> and uh, that had all that had to go by the wayside. But Those Chevelles made cool-looking stock cars, didn't oh, they? Oh, and so many of them got used up. When, <laughs> when, I, when I got into racing, it's kind of because I bought a house, and my neighbors were race fans, and and I went to a race with them, and then next thing I know, I'm, I got the fever bad, and then it didn't go away for forty some years. But uh, so you never like started out in go karts or anything like never, that, no, really? No. Oh, okay, no. so how old were you when you actually like hopped in a race car for the first time? Twenty five. Really? Yeah. Really I late 20, by today's standards. Twenty five before I saw the first race too. Wow. Yeah. Really? So mm-hmm. that what were you what were you into in those years? Was it a, was it sticking ball sports and stuff? Uh, um. So I get out of high school. I'm I'm headed to college. Not really sure. Ended up at Rowan Cabarrus Community College and took all their trade classes. Mm-hmm. And my two major ones were uh, HVAC and electrical. Mm-hmm. Well, by the time I get through with that, local high school there, South Rowan High School, decides they vocational education was really weak in Rowan County and not only Rowan but North Carolina. So they started putting money in vocational education, and they decided they wanted those trades taught in high school. So uh, they came to me and said, hey, we're fixing to start this program. You'd be interested in teaching it. And I'd only been out of school a year. And yeah, I, that was like the whole thing. You were like the race car driver that was also the high school shop teacher, right? Yeah, but I wasn't a race car driver yet. I didn't but, know anything about any of that. Okay. So uh, they, enter, they also offered me a job being the wrestling coach and assistant football coach. That's what got me in. Were you into wrestling? Yes, oh, okay. when I was in school. And okay. uh, yeah, anyway, uh, more football, but wrestling. I wrestled the whole time. Okay. Anyway, that got me to take the job, and I did. And right after that, I bought a house, and and uh, then within about a year or so, I went to a race with my neighbors, and uh, it was on a Sunday afternoon, the old Metrolina Fairground. And I'm like, I gotta do that. I'd been drag racing on the street. I'd 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 done well on the street for a long time, street racing. Oh, so you were already into cars? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was into cars, gotcha. but ne- never on any kind of anything official. It was midnight racing. What did you, what did you do? On, what kind of car did you do street racing with? Well, myself, I had a, a Chevy two that ran pretty good back in the day. I had a Boss three hundred two Mustang that ran really good. Mm-hmm. But I had started for a while driving other people's cars. Uh, there was some stuff that had gotten pretty wild out there, and they'd build these cars. It's, they wouldn't. They were scared to drive them. Well, I wasn't scared to drive them. So, uh, <laughs> and, and money was exchanging hands, and, and it was good for a while. Okay. Uh, but then when I went to a round track race, I'm like, hmm, they 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 get to race for an hour. You know, I'm racing for ten seconds. Did you get busted by the cops the street racing? I did one time. Yep. Just once. Just one. I, well, I got pursued many times, but I, <laughs> I I got caught one time, and that was expensive. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, and that was in my daddy's car, and so that was a that was a big deal. But dad we, get mad. Well, he got mad. He he kind of had to. He my dad kind of had to itch to go fast too. Mm-hmm. We never raced or anything, but uh, uh, we just I just. Normally, you know, where we raced got to be known, and they would be part of the race fun was the chase after. And uh, luckily, most of the time I got away, but one time I didn't, and uh, so I, I didn't get to drive for a year after that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, so, but you you took it to the track though, and that was the early years because that's yep. that's what I everyone said. You went from <laughs> dirt to pavement in your career because. <laughs> The, the dirt racing that I remember is seeing you in that red wedge Coors light car. I never got to see the car, but I've seen it in pictures and yeah. in video. And so that's yeah. where that's where it all started for you at Metrolina? Uh, not quite. Uh, so my neighbor, the, the, the cutting up Chevelle things where it just kind of got started, uh, I had the fever bad. And my neighbor had already started building him a car. He was going to do it too. He had the fever. 
Uh, and he was cutting up Chevelles. Uh, crazy. And I think back now, I'm, holy cow, 396, 66 Chevelles and 65, nice 65s and stuff. And and so I had the fever. Uh, he built a street stock car. And he said, why don't you come and drive this thing on – on uh, I can't remember if it was Friday or Saturday. I believe Metrolina raced on Friday and Hickory raced on Saturday. And he said, I'll drive it Friday night at Metrolina. You race Saturday night at Hickory. So we on we'd, pavement on pavement. Okay, so one night on dirt, one night on pavement. No, it was both the pavement then. Metrolina was pavement. Back oh, okay. Then. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and we did that for the rest of that one year, and mm-hmm. then at the end of that year, uh, I decided ah, this street stock racing, this stuff ain't getting it, and I don't know. Anyway, I just I'd went to a couple of dirt races that by then, and I'm like, I want to do that. So I took a year off, and built a dirt car myself and and friends. And uh, when we went back dirt racing, we went to Metrolina at the beginning of the year in 78 or 9, right in there, 79, 80, right in there. And I won the first time on dirt. Really? Yep, at Metrolina. In your car that you built? Yep, in my car that I built. Now, <clears throat> without any kind of you know, dirt car building experience, yep. what, what were you doing? Were you talking to people on how to build something ahead of time, or did you just try something and it worked? Uh, I, I talking to people, you know, there were lots of there were lots of routes around the Canapolis area for dirt track racing. Mm-hmm. Everybody's backyard about had a garage in it, and and uh, they wouldn't tell you a whole lot, but I could I could find out enough, and I had a little suspension knowledge and some stuff. What I had learned through from the time I drove until the time I finally ran dirt, I did a lot of watching, which I never watched before. I'd get, I went to Speed Weeks twice and watched, and just lived in the pits and took it in and i found out that uh the weight meant a lot and people were building heavy cars big heavy cars i built a lightweight car and 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 then it went further than that but i had a weight advantage first time i ever went and everybody knew it so the second time i ran uh they crashed me and it tore it up and it took me quite a while to come back oh uh, because it tore it up so bad but but by then by the time i came back i'd figured out even more and built it lighter and faster and, uh, and 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 for a while after that, they couldn't catch me. Now, uh, uh, this was this in the late model division. Uh, this this is what they call the semi modified division, which would be like pro late models now. Okay. It was actually an inline six cylinder division. Oh, okay. And it was extremely popular mm-hmm. uh, through the south here, Lancaster, Chester, okay. Metrolina, Concord. So you can travel around if you want. Oh to. yeah, travel around. We had you know it. it it got to where in eighty three, four, and five around in there. You could race for big money somewhere every weekend. That, that's what I was going to ask you. Could you actually, you know, race and make make money in that time? Well, by by eighty three, uh, by eighty three and four, I'd got to where I was making way more money racing than I was teaching. Really? And and but I was still loving coaching. Yeah, they, we didn't sleep any back then. But, right. Uh, so, <laughs> how old were you around uh, this time? Uh, so in eighty two, I would have been uh, thirty. Okay. And then, you know, the early 30s then. Mm-hmm. So we just, uh, and when you're winning, you know, we, I won 64 races in 83. Uh, just in 1983 alone? In 1983 alone. Wow. So that, uh, you know, that, and, and they're all, you know, you're not buying a set of tires every race. I bill them on, bill them everything. And right. cars is out of the junkyard and, and with some local machine shop help, bill them on motors and stuff. And so when you'd go win 1000 1500 $2,000, Except for a couple hundred dollars you spent on fuel and pit passes, that was profit. Okay, yeah, and, you're yeah, right. yeah, <clears throat> and, and then it got more than that. So I mean, they were like, we won log cabin, uh, one of those years right there, and it paid like five thousand to win, and that was a big race at Withful twice. It paid five or ten thousand to win. I can't remember. So they were big paying races, and I was racing the same stuff I was racing at Concord. And this is when you would go to the pay window and they give you cash, cash right? money. <laughs> oh my god, cash money. That's great. Yeah. Holy, 64 wins in one. Now, was that all on dirt in one year? It was all on dirt, six-cylinder racing. Okay, six-cylinder. Yeah. Now, at what time, uh, what uh, year did you finally build that that Coors number, was it number six? Number six. six. Number six, yeah. The, yeah. the wedge body car. Well, these the, at the, at the, in 83, I built a six-cylinder wedge car. And that was that, that kind of caught everybody with their pants down for a little while because nobody – I went to Speed Weeks and saw – the wedge cars mm-hmm. so i come back home and i'm building one now and i show up at concord and they try every rule and the, they try to write rules so i can't run it but everybody was building them fast 
uh, wanting, wanting to run them because they were faster, mm-hmm. that they that uh, we stay ahead of the rules. Uh, they didn't ever get to outlaw them. And then by 84, that was the norm. So uh, you were doing a lot of innovating. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, finding gray areas and yeah was that was that always been something that was your thing finding a gray area in the rule book uh I, it was but i didn't know it i didn't know that's what i was doing you know i was just trying to figure out a way to go faster and i really wasn't paying attention to rules sometimes that'd be there wasn't a lot of rules so back in that day and and before there was a time forever i mean that came from the jalopies and all that stuff they never thought aerodynamics they thought if you had more motor than everybody else, you're going to win the race. Mm-hmm. Well, I learned early that isn't the case. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, you got to have motor and good motor, but you didn't have to have more motor. The middle of the corner was where it was won at, mm-hmm. and the bodies paid, they paid big benefits right there. Uh, but in 85, at the end of 84, uh, the super late model racing stuff, uh, I had really started wanting to do that. Couldn't afford it, but started having some offers from some manufacturers really no, when you, you say super late models you mean dirt super late models dirt, or pavement? dirt super late okay models. dirt super late. yeah okay. the motors i couldn't afford well right. or, or racing head service rhs they were already big into that and and uh, they wanted me to run their engine so they made me a deal i couldn't turn down so halfway through 84 and then 85 we had super late models okay. i had both for a while so you were racing with guys like freddie smith yeah. and uh mike duval and all, yeah. and all the okay so you're all those guys those legends of the day too yeah oh absolutely oh awesome uh, absolutely do you yeah. do you uh do, do you miss the dirt do you, do you go back and uh check out a dirt race every once in a while uh occasionally i do mm-hmm. uh I do miss it, and and the go kart racing stuff we're doing now, it's it's all dirt, so it kind of gives you the same sensation. Mm-hmm. And uh, but, you know, it's it's one of those things that, uh, as a driver, uh, my career came to an end because I couldn't win enough to pay the bills. Used to win enough money to make money and pay the bills. Right. Well, the, the times you, changed. You made a lot. I was talking with Doug uh, today. I would think it was well, just one year racing a Concord. You made over a hundred grand or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He he was telling me about it. Just winning Big Ten races and and all that. Yeah. Wow. And so if you could get enough sponsorship to cover your expenses, then what you won, you could you know it's kind of profit. So that's. I retired from teaching at 20 years because I got to the point that if I had to miss a race, I could make more money on a Saturday night than I could make in a month teaching. Mm-hmm. And so I had 20 years in, so it gets a little early retirement for that and insurance. So we got out of that and went racing full time. But that was we was already asphalt racing then. The dirt thing, it uh, it it my dirt racing ended when they paved Concord Speedway uh, because I had Coors Beer as a sponsor. Mm-hmm. And it was through Piedmont Distributors in Salisbury. Mm-hmm. And, and and Ted Proctor, that used to own that, brought Coors Beer, really, to North Carolina. He brought it to the East Coast. Okay. So we were kind of on the leading edge of that with Bill Elliott, and it was all kind of part of a package. And then when Coors Light came, uh, we switched from Coors Light, uh, Coors to Coors Light. And that was all through Ted Proctor and Piedmont Distributors right. in Salisbury. I remember because there was, down south, there was, I remember seeing like the ad campaigns with Bill Elliott's car, and yeah. I think yours was on a few ad we, campaigns. And then yep. up north, it was the extra gold team. So you had Mike McLaughlin and uh, 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 I think John, uh, one of the Johnsons, and each car was black and gold and had the extra gold sponsorship. Yeah. So, okay. So it was, you know, it was all kind of a, a package deal. And uh, so when they, when they paved Concord the first year, I said, I ain't, I'm not going to run asphalt. I'm, I'm on, I was at the top of the game on dirt by then. So I'm like, you know, I can run down here at Fayetteville and Lancaster. I can go to Gaffney, Chester. There was a couple others. I could go there and, if not win, run pretty good, make some, keep making a living, and mm-hmm. keep doing what I know. Well, so I did it in, like, 88. And at the end of that year, Ted Proctor, Piedmont Distributor, says, hey, here's the deal. If you're not going to run in my district, then I can't justify spending the money we're spending to promote your racing. Okay. He said, so either you got to get back down at Concord or you're going to lose this Coors sponsor. So that's when it became Coors Light, and that next year we went to Concord and and, and, and built an asphalt car and started running asphalt. And uh, you built your own asphalt car, too, out of the gate? The, yeah. fir- the first year, when I, when I refused, I just wasn't going to do it. And then <clears throat> Tony Furr, uh, Henry Furr's son, 
he calls me up one day and he says it was at the end of the year i think of 87 and it was the last race of the year tony fur nascar tony fur yes right okay and, and his daddy henry fur is the one that owned concourse Speedway. right mm -hmm. so he calls me up he says hey you and me need to get together i said what do you mean and this was the last race of 87 and that was the year i didn't run uh, on asphalt and i had never ran a super late model asphalt race or any asphalt race except my dirt car on asphalt and he said, uh, "You, I, the motor you got will work perfect for what we're doing here at Concord. I don't have a motor. I got a car. We got a big 10 race. Pays 10,000 a win coming up. Let's get together and run it. So we did. And we led everything but the last two laps. And Jack Sprague passed me and won the race. <laughs> <laughs> but then at the end of that year, I bought that car. And, uh, okay. and, and he, he had already had some NASCAR stuff he was doing. And I, I bought all the stuff. And and then we've been asked we were asphalt racing from then on how long was the conversion for you or the, i should say the, the the comfortability time to get comfortable going from dirt to pavement was it right away was it was it right away oh, okay so in fact at the end of 86 it's when, usually the case right it, yeah. because it's a lot harder to go from pavement to dirt than it is from dirt to pavement so i have a story on that i, I had that opportunity uh after a couple of years on asphalt a guy came to me, and they used to be the World 100 and all these big dirt races at oh, yeah. the end of the year. And he came to me. He said, hey, I want to run like three or four of these things. And he said, I got a new car and all this. He said, let's, uh, let's, let's see if your dirt skills are still polished, and we'll go run them races at the end of the year. So we go to Chester to run a local race. Good stuff. I flip it in practice. Oh, no. And I didn't, How many years ago was this? Well, I had missed – I'd been off dirt three or four years. Oh, okay. So – and and had I not been – I, I, I attacked the track aggressively like I always did, but I had not been on dirt, and it was my fault. I just ran off the track. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'd eased into it a little more, I probably would have got the dirt feel back. When I got in a go kart, I got it back quick. Really? Uh, yeah. But I, and I'd never raced go karts, so uh, yeah, it was easier going from dirt to asphalt. Way easier than going back to dirt off asphalt. Really? Yeah. And, and you'd be amazed, too, because uh, the, even the go-kart racing now is so hard because the finesse oh. or how little you have to move your, your hands is yeah. tremendous. They about drive it ourselves, especially <laughs> the tire prepping thing's what eats me up right now. It's got us all just, it's just we don't want to do it, but you got to do it. That's what kind of turns me off to to go-kart racing because that when I was a kid, that's what I raced. I raced yeah. go-karts, but... Yeah. When we did go-kart racing back in the 90s, you know, tire prep was cardinal sin, you know. That yeah. was blasphemy. You don't, you don't touch that stuff. You don't right. go anywhere near it. You're a cheater if you use it and all that. Yep. Now, you walk into a go-kart pit area, oh. and it'll clear your sinuses. Oh, you can't go into trailers. I, I mean, it's, it's crazy. The guys, you know, hot boxing tires and putting them in oh, rotisseries yeah. and everything. Oh, yeah. My back, the back of my shop looks like a laboratory back there. <sighs> God. It's crazy. You ever, you, you ever check out the Outlaw carts? You ever, you ever seen them? I do, I do. They're pretty badass. Oh, it's, you know, a, it's, a, it's incredible. I've got a couple of them actually. I race, uh, but I run the divisions that you can't prep the tires. And, well, yeah. actually, you can't prep tires in Outlaw kart racing at all. Yeah, I know. Uh, you're not allowed to. But uh, the, I tell you what, that is that's some fun stuff to do. Hey, too. my hat's off to you. The, so, the, the sensation of speed that y'all get in those things has got to be incredible. It, it, well, we have um, well they they don't run them much anymore. We run the open division, mm -hmm. so we had uh, Honda CR five hundreds, mm -hmm. you know, all completely built and, and done up. Mine, God, mine must have had like eighty or ninety horsepower, all in a car that was four hundred and fifty pounds with the driver. Yeah, so it was. You know, you hit the gas. The first time I remember hopping in one, because I raced midgets uh, and modifieds on pavement most of my life. And then in 2012, tried dirt and tried one of these outlaw carts. And I thought, you know, it was fun. It looked like a toy. It was little and everything. And I hit the gas in that thing, and it pinned me back in the seat. Oh, sure. And the first thing that I said to Kyle Beatty when I come off the track was, there's a lot more race car here than I thought. Yeah. It was, it was something. Oh, it's incredible. And they are, and yeah. they're wild. And I've been upside down, and I've raced with Rico and Kyle Larson and all those guys. Oh, and, awesome. and I'll be honest with you, it made me a better driver. Oh, I'm it, sure. It really did, because yeah. I would hop in my father's midget and uh, you know, go run my father's midget somewhere, and I would have a better 
car feel. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I totally believe that those well, things I, are. I tell you, any, great anybody that hadn't around. seen those things run, they 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 need to find out where they're at and go watch them because it's incredible. I do PR at Mountain Creek uh, Speedway. Okay. Uh, which is down the road from Millbridge. We I've, run s- I've seen you up there. Yeah, yeah. That. I've been up there. I hadn't raced there, but I've been to watch a couple times. You got to come out and check it out because we run flat carts on Saturday nights. I well, mean, say they don't have a heavy class. So I. Yeah. Can, no, we do. We have a heavy class. Uh, would you run two? Is it two oh six? You got no. no. Yeah. And I could run that class, but okay. what I, what we have, <clears throat> the go-kart thing all started, I had a guy working for me that bought some property close to me, uh-huh. and then his son, his name's Tony Wilson Jr., is in the concrete business, he he bought the property and turned it into a state-of-the-art track. We came up with our own rules, and uh, so basically what we've got is a, called a super stock class, a stock appearing class, and there's a 425-pound weight division in both classes. But the motors are unique to anywhere else. I mean, the stock appearing motor at Mountain Creek mm-hmm. is the same motor, but they're 350 pounds. So okay. I can't go up there and run that. Okay, uh, gotcha. But the guys that run it, they come to Tony's and run and put the weight on and run the 425 pound. And, and, and which track is this? It's 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 called Starnes Farm Speedway. Okay, okay, I've I've heard of it, Starnes yeah. Farms. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they they have had the outlaw carts up there, I think, before, haven't they? Uh, not as a formal race, but open to them at uh, the, when we have races, basically just for expedition. Okay, to show everybody what they're about. Right. Uh, no, none of the real heavy hitters have been there. Right. Uh, uh, but it's a great track. We used to. Uh, now they've got um, the well, the two strokes have have kind of gone away and mm-hmm. now they're all running the 450 stock motors which is kind of like a crate engine division for the outlaw carts it's yeah. just 450 motor four stroke stock bore stock stroke and you just you pull it off the bike you put it on the cart and you go racing yeah, that's so good. i can't run mine with them because mine's all built and you know it's it's all blown out yeah but uh but yeah they are so much fun mm. and uh it, it they're badass if you ever get a chance hop in one seriously <laughs> they are a lot of fun oh man. i just can't and, and Millbridge is such a a trip we te- we rented it my, uh this past saturday morning went up there and tested our group mm-hmm. and uh and that racetrack is with the walls around it the way it is and it's rough and and it throws rocks all the time uh, it's just treacherous i can't imagine running those things around there it's like that. it's a fun job. i've been around millbridge many times matter of fact i've got two track champion winter series championships at millbridge oh, yeah. uh, one in 2013 and 2014 um but yeah millbridge is a uh if you can run at millbridge and win there you can win anywhere yeah uh yeah it is a uh, one of those types of tracks and i have been on my head many times around that place yeah uh one night, I think I broke the altitude record trying to race Kyle Larson for the lead in the heat race, and he went he went down to the bottom, and I tried to roll around the top, and I'm rim riding the top for all it's worth, and caught the right front just over the cushion, and it sucked me in into those JoJo blocks off it of too, and she just went up the wall like a ramp, and uh, up she went. And I think I got as high as the second set of oh, billboards. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's treacherous. The track owner comes over to me. He's like, "Did you see? Did you know how high you were?" Yeah, I knew I was up high. Because when you got up, you wait for the hit, and I waited a really long time for the hit. So yeah. by the, when I didn't feel nothing, I'm like, holy shit, I'm really up here. And then bang, bang, you know, and then it come in. I had so. a wreck at Concord several years ago where I got turned through the dog leg and it did, did the spinning helicopter thing. I kept waiting for the big hit, and it never happened. Mm-hmm. And people that see that, and now it's on YouTube and some other places, they'll watch that wreck. and like, oh, God, I did, he must have broke a lot of stuff. And I'm like... I really never hit anything hard. It was just looked violent and, right. and was. It was an expensive wreck, but uh, not what, the hit is what gets you. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the the fence. I remember you hit the you hit the fence, or you went you went to the outside of Dennis Schoenfeld. Yep. Schoenfeld got loose going through the dog leg. Yeah, and he kind of did one. He porpoised up the track, and you caught him with the left front and just that's it. Used him like a ramp. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. I'm, all you must have saw was the wall and then trees, right? I just saw a lot of chaos. As far as any details about what I saw, I can't remember what it was, but it was just, you know, I, I knew, I threw, I figured I was going through the fence. I remember years ago, Jeff Purvis up there did, mm-hmm. uh, but the fence wasn't like it is now then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I figured I was going to go through the fence, and then the trees out there is going to be a problem. But yeah. the fence did its job. It held me in. It threw me back on the racetrack. So. Mm-hmm. I, I was there. Doug Smith and I were calling the race that night because Concord was – the first track I started announcing at after I moved down here from up north. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Doug Smith and I were were the track announcers, and we were. I remember watching the whole thing happen with my own two eyes, and <laughs> just thinking, "Holy cow, that yeah. is that's nasty." Yeah. Uh, 
How bad was the car? Was the car completely destroyed, or did were you able to rebuild it? So, um, yes and no. We rebuilt it. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, what we did was, uh, of course, it, it uh, tore the bottom out of the oil pan, rubbed the bottom of the transmission through and the rear end, took all the running works out, and we cut the frame off the roll cage. I had to race again the next week. Right, I remember that. So we cut the frame off the roll cage. And Came back and won, didn't you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and thanks to Dean Clattenburg and Robert Hamke, they, they went to work on Sunday morning mm -hmm. building a frame, and we made the plan what we was going to do before we left the track Saturday night. And uh, on Sunday morning, they went to work and built a frame, and we went to work and cut right at the frame to cut the roll cage off. And, at the firewall? Uh, uh, well, basically, the, 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 the firewall, the interior, what body I could leave on it, all the wiring, plumbing, everything I could leave on it, I left. Mm -hmm. I just sawed the frame and dropped it out from under the roll cage wow. and all. So it didn't hurt any of the bars up front, any, out back, any of that stuff. It just eroded away the bottom of the frame. It was, it was a halfway worn, too. Yeah. Like two by three became inch and a half by two. Wow. That, just from grinding on the wall. So they got that done about Tuesday, and uh, and we carried my roll cage and all over there. And while the frame was on the jig, set the roll cage and all on it, and welded it all up, and painted it with spray bombs. And <laughs> my engine, uh, Jeff Hamner was building my motors down in Birmingham, <laughs> Alabama, and he got it all fixed up. Had it back to us Wednesday night, and uh, other stuff got fixed. And uh, by Friday afternoon, we Did had it all back together. Did you ship the engine down there or drive it down? Uh well, uh, let's, I can't remember. We were we were shipping stuff when we had time, mm -hmm. but his daddy, uh, who was retired, that started Hamner Racing Engines, was kind of like he just did whatever he could do for Jeff. So my wife would take the motor a lot of times in my truck and meet him in Commerce, Georgia, and he would come from Birmingham and they'd slide it out of his truck into mine, and then she'd come back home with it. So okay, that's what happened then. That way, your 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 late model stuff was a huge family effort too, right? Oh because, yeah. Because uh, when you won the the All Pro Championship, what was it? You you were driving, your son was crew chiefing, and your yep. wife was spotting. Yeah, is that what it was? That's exactly right, and that's the no way it kidding. was for years and years. Yeah. Wow. We would go on the road. That that race there's a perfect example. We would show up and not have a pit crew. Mm -hmm. And then Alex and I, through people we knew, especially if anything NASCAR was there, like trucks or bush, we knew people, and we would we would recruit people to put up a you know a pit crew, and and it kind of got to be a, a fun deal because we we had a chance to win everywhere we went, luckily, mm -hmm. and people would want to be on our pit crew because they're gonna get their picture made. Right, and, right. and they and, knew uh, Freddie was coming, and he had a shot to to win, and it worked out good for us. We went to Odessa, <laughs> Missouri. Went to Odessa, Missouri to race, and I'd never been there, and uh, the trucks were there. Fast track. And, yeah, and Jack Sprague's truck team, I'd become friends with all them. So we had it planned before we go, and uh, I, we run the first 100 laps in pit, and I think I was, I was running second or third. I never even tried to pass because I knew I was going to beat them off pit road, and we did, and <laughs> led the rest of the race and won it. That was a big party that night. Were but, you catching uh, a lot of crap from the other teams? Well, you're, only get, you're doing this because uh, you got an NASCAR crew, and... If I was, I didn't pay any attention. All I wanted to do is win races, and mm -hmm. anything got said, done, whatever behind my back or even to my face, I didn't care. I seventy is where I did my second ever television broadcast from. It was oh, yeah. an ASA race yeah. back, back in the day, but I do remember I seventy being uh, high banked yeah. and wicked fast. Wicked fast. Wicked. Yeah, it had a dog leg in it too. Yeah. So, matter of speaking of dog leg, you ran Concord before the dog leg, right? I did. Yeah okay yeah. so uh, as dirt and then converted it to pavement mm -hmm. um so concord first had a back stretch yes and then they ripped it down for a dog leg yep now what was the reasoning behind that i heard it was because henry fur was trying to get a bush race there right? he was okay. and it had to add more seats and the way the land laid down there the only way he could add more seats was to he had to he had to increase the seating capacity on the front side of the racetrack. There was no way to do it on the back side. So what he did was he just pushed where the where the first turn was. He just opened the exit of the first turn up and increased seating down around through that to the dog leg. Mm -hmm. And also he wanted to have a racetrack like nobody else had too. And uh, which it was it was and uh, and he put the seating there. But NASCAR never let him have the race, so he never got to have a bush or a truck race. He must have been mad. He was. He tore all the seating back up. Oh, okay. That's yeah. why all the hillsides there, yeah. I guess. was. Okay. Yeah. Right. So is that why you were so good at Concord? Because you 
probably had more laps through that dog leg than anybody or, or just or did you figure it out or was it just a combination of all of it combination of all of it uh, in the very beginning there were people that didn't like it because it was extremely treacherous mm-hmm. and if you could hold your car wide open and back then we had 2700 pound cars with over 600 horsepower if you could hold it wide open through that dog leg, it was a half a second, right. literally, literally an honest half a second. Yeah, because you had to drive them back then. Oh, you and you they're not locked down like they are now. No, yeah. when you came up the other side of the dog leg, you were going to be turning to the right. And I learned a lot about turning to the right on asphalt and what to do to a car to make it comfortable to do it. Because basically on asphalt, when you turn to the right, especially back in the day, your car would take a right and you're going to be in trouble. Mm-hmm. But uh, bring the mic a little closer. Yeah, yeah. There, there was only a, there was only a handful of people that liked it, mm-hmm. and the, and the handful of people that liked it was my competition, Jack Sprague, Rich Bickle. <laughs> you know, there's those two mainly, but there was a couple others. Right. Uh, but it also scared off some racers. I remember, I ain't gonna mention any names, but I remember some good racers coming in there like a Big Ten weekend, mm-hmm. and they'd test, practice, they wouldn't even qualify. They'd be loading up and leaving. They would say they're not gonna race, not gonna race on that. It was uh, it was wild. I ran a street stock race there once in 2007, <laughs> just one time. I got to drive a friend's car there, yeah. and I had had years of experience racing midgets and modifieds. And here I am in a you know big, big heavy street stock. Yeah. And I remember feeling like I was flying in the street stock. Oh yeah. And thought to myself, I cannot imagine what this place must feel like in a late model, a super, or a modified. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'm in a street stock right now, and this thing weighs, you know, 3,500 pounds and has maybe 350 horsepower mm-hmm. or at the most. And thinking, I'm flying. Yeah, uh, yeah. And going through that dog leg was treacherous. I I did it. It know? was. It yeah. was. And 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 then again, you know, I did get thousands of laps there, mm-hmm. so it kind of kind of became second nature. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting what you said about Millbridge a minute ago because it was always preached at Concord. If you can win here, you can win anywhere. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of truth to that. I remember going to Bristol and Winchester the first couple of times and the sensation of whatever it was there that made your heart beat fast uh, was the next level from Concord. But most every other racetrack I ever went to, went to Nazareth, went to I-70, you know, all those fast racetracks. The sensation of speed wasn't what it was through the dog legs. I was way more comfortable than a lot of people were. Yeah, it was uh, almost like running through a tunnel going through there in a way uh, because yeah. you couldn't get down on that curb because no. the curb would shoot you up the track. Yep. I, I had told a lot of people over the years, the place, referencing two tracks up north, the place was almost like you took half of Flemington. I don't know if you ever saw Flemington. I saw it, but I hadn't raced on it. I raced midgets at Flemington, and that place was super scary it's a five eighths mile square it has four individual corners so Mm -hmm. you just round the place off and it has walls on the inside and the outside so you are running in a tunnel all race long yeah and you can't see coming around the next corner so that's what kind of made it treacherous too because the inside wall but it felt like somebody took a half of flemington and a half of riverside park speedway which was a small little narrow quarter mile up north in massachusetts and slammed the two of them together Mm -hmm. because you got through the dog leg, you went down the back straightaway, and then you had to make that hard left going into three and four, and four, well, turn three, they don't call it four, jumped right up on you. Yeah. And if if you hit it wrong, you were you were, you were burying yourself into that wall coming oh, yeah. off the corner. Well, that's the way it was at Concord, uh, right past the dog leg, coming up the hill out of the dog leg, and also going in the first turn, because the whole racetrack was set up by what you did in the first turn. Mm-hmm. If you if you did it right, if you did the entry and exit and through the middle of one right, then the rest of the track almost took care of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you didn't, then you you struggling the rest of the time. And then, and if you're struggling through the dog leg, it's a handful. Is this what you would tell all the drivers that would give you a call and ask you how you figure yeah. it out? Because the rumors and you know the legend over the years is. If you if you're going to run Concord, call Freddie Query. Like yeah. you you've had some well known names call you up and ask you the secret of the place. Right? I have. Who, who who are some of those guys? Uh, Mike Eddy was one of the main ones. Really? Uh, we we got to the be polar bear, huh? Yeah, we'd got to be buddies at Speed Weeks. We used to run Volusia together down there and New Smyrna, and got to be buddies. Um, one year he won. One year he won. Uh, we raced nine nights in a row. He won eight of them. I won one. The next year I won eight of them. He won one. We'd got to be good buddies. Down at Volusia. At Volusia. Uh, when it was paved, when right? When it was paved, Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
So anyway, he had they were having an ASA race, and he called me, wanted me to come down there and test with him. And I did, and he wasn't sure about that place because it just really kind of didn't suit his driving style. Yeah. And he wouldn't run power steering uh, forever, really? forever, until he came to Concord. No and they came to test, and I went down there to the test with them, and I told him, I said, what's killing you is what you're experiencing in that dog leg and know, knowing you can't be quick enough if something don't go just right. And he came back, he had power steering, he ran it from then on. Uh, but he he fought running power steering way way late. So Concord made him convert. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow! Yeah. So this yeah. is Mike Getty. Who else? Uh, well, Bob Seneca came. He he tested and we helped him what we could. He didn't run. He was one of the guys that loaded up. Really, Butch, Butch Miller. Really, uh, Butch Miller loaded up too. No, Butch Miller didn't. Bob oh. Seneca did. Bob Seneca. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh. And then uh, Davin Sites. There were some ASA racers that you know when it was going to run ASA came through there and. And wanted help, but I helped most all the local people too. And my philosophy was, I want you to be as good as you can be, because I don't want to be out there around you on this racetrack the way it is, and you struggling, trying to figure it out. Be as good as you can be. I want to beat you as good as you can be. Right. And so that was all. I thought that way everywhere. Well, the big thing about Concord too was, is you, you if you screwed up going through there you had the big one happen on on a short track oh, because yeah. i remember some guys getting screwed up going through the dog leg and you know once the dominoes fall six eight or oh, ten yeah. cars are involved yeah and you could be running anywhere in the pack get collected in it mm-hmm. so so bob seneca loaded up and left mm-hmm. oh, and i would think i would find that a little crazy because he ran winchester oh, he had run he was the man salem there. right yeah so you'd be used to those high speed places but that's what I'm saying. Salem, and I didn't include it a minute ago, but Salem, Winchester, and Bristol, they, they're unique. And uh, the sensations you get there were the next level from Concord. Mm-hmm. So that, that did surprise me. But the, um, Did you like Winchester? Uh, I didn't at first. Really? Yeah, but well, because the first time I went is when it was full of holes. Yeah, I don't know if you were ever around it back in the day. The holes were a foot and a half deep. And I remember going there. I remember going there to an all-pro race back in the early 90s, and I wasn't running all-pro, but we went to like, it must have been the 400. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. We go there, and uh, we go a day early, and I go out there and walk around that track, and I'm like, there's no way. There's no way. Because where you can see the groove is is where all these holes were. We just, it was just the track. Was they just were massive. Irregularities. I'm talking potholes, like we got all over the place out here now. Right. And be really. a foot, foot and a half deep. Mm-hmm. I go, this was on the day before we started, and they had an ARCA race that day. So I'm going to sit in the stands and watch and see where they run because somehow they're missing all these holes, and I'm hearing you got to run right up at the fence. Gary Bradbury won the race and led every single lap and hit every hole there every <laughs> single lap because that's where the groove is. <laughs> so when I went back the next day, I had to just blind, my, blind myself to these holes, and actually they didn't feel that violent in the car. Because you're hitting them at full power? You're or? hitting them at full power, and I guess you, when your tires come off the ground, they're hitting time for them to get to the bottom of the hole. You're just kind of like skimming across the top. And, and it was years. Uh, it was Well, that was early 90s, so up until mid to late 90s, they never fixed it. They, it stayed like that. Wow. And then when they resurfaced it, it just got faster. Mm-hmm. And it's it's good surface now okay. uh, to race on. But You were in Winchester. Did you run Salem, too? Yeah, ran okay. Salem, too. How was Salem compared to Winchester? Uh, I'd been to Salem, but not Winchester. Yeah, it's Winchester. You, then you ran both ends right at the fence. Mm-hmm. Uh, Salem, you would run three and four at the fence, and one and two, you'd be kind of down the middle of the track. So you had to kind of learn that. But there's a lot of similarities, just cause you just got to learn that. I mean, we didn't we didn't lift, you mm-hmm. know, for a while, especially Bristol. But Winchester and Salem, you'd you'd kind of run wide open. Running wide open, I, I don't much care for that. I like lifting. Right. Uh, even if you just lift and go right back to it, it's just something about the way the car sets, and it puts a different kind of confidence in your mind or something. When you don't lift, it's like that little part right there when you're, when you're supposed to lift and don't, that really works heavy on your brain. And you th- I, I, I struggled with that. Do you think that's the issue with a lot of these kids that are running late models and super late models now is that they have these things so – stuck down to the track that that you know they're just they go in back off back in the throttle and and then just go do you do you, do you think that's the current issue that we're dealing with right now well that's a big part of it yeah uh, there's a lot there's lots of ingredients there that's a problem in my mind with what we're dealing with today and i'm not dealing with it uh, i got out of it you know several years ago from building cars and teaching people and stuff but 
it got to the point, and, and I know it's the same way out there now, that uh, uh, there was money surrounding these kids. And for the longest time, it was parents. Now it can be whatever. You know, these kids show talent in go-karts, midgets, whatever, quarter midgets. And and they think, well, and, and they can get on iRace and win, so, like, they're, they're naturals. You know, they can go do this. Well, it's in those kids' heads. Well, they don't have to. They don't sh- – they show up at the track and drive them. Right. They don't they're have the pain. On them. No, the pain is after the race till the next race. You know, that's that's when it's hard, finding money and working and making stuff and fixing stuff and all that. That's that's the hard part. Well, they don't experience any of that. Mm-hmm. They show up and drive them, and that's what they're expected to do. So it's changed the way they race. I mean, I listen to Bubba Pollard and some of the older – it's hard to call Bubba Pollard an older guy, but he is a senior racer now. He's a veteran. He's a veteran. Uh, and and I and I was experiencing the last couple of years. I was around racing. I was helping people, building cars. Yeah, like, I remember seeing you at the track, like doing what was it, driver coaching or, yeah. or crew chiefing or, or stuff like that. But you were working with some of these young kids, right? And good ones, right? And, and coast to coast, I had them all all over, mm-hmm. and a lot a lot of talented kids. But none of them ever came from. They weren't. They weren't. Uh, they weren't. Uh, they didn't come up hard. And come up hard they didn't come up with their hands dirty they didn't they weren't kids like all the racers i ever knew back when i raced they, they these guys grew up working on something you know they were all the time tinkering doing something it might be the bicycle the lawnmower they were all the time grease monkeys mm-hmm. uh, well that's gone and and, and it got gone the, through the last 10 years that i helped people do it i had to swallow it <laughs> i always have said that if you don't change with the times Times is going to leave you behind. So mm-hmm. I had to bite my tongue a lot of times and to stay involved and do what the times required. Right, because sometimes these kids can get tough to deal with. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. And, and the kids weren't so bad as the parents. And that, yeah. that's that's what I experienced in the last couple of years I taught school, too. You know, I'd have kid problems that I can handle that. I can fix that. Mm-hmm. But when they go home and the parents say, well, it's the teacher's fault. It wasn't your fault. And then, then it got the administration wouldn't back you. Well, it's, it's kind of that way in racing now, you know. It's uh, we'll see where it goes, but it's just uh, it, biting your tongue though. It it, it must have been it, it it must have sucked because you know you want these kids to be tougher or these kids should be tougher because uh, they they gotta handle challenges and yeah. and I I kind of help you know some some young kids along the way too. Even my nephew, my nephew is running midgets up north and. Uh, it, there's the times where I have to drill into him. Listen, it's it's the hard work that makes the win. You appreciate the win, you yeah. know. If you you can't just quit when when you when you get challenged because you're gonna have other challenges in life. Oh yeah, you're gonna have to deal with it. Yeah, well, it, it's it's all about it's life skills you're teaching, not only about how to race, but one of my problems was I'd get attached to the kids because a lot of them had a lot of talent, mm-hmm. and and a lot of them had want to. Uh, I'd get attached to them. And then the parents would not only be hard on me sometimes, but they'd be hard on the kid. And as you know, in racing, there's lots of stuff happens that isn't your fault. But at the end of the day, when you look back on it and it costs money and blah, 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 we're going to point the finger somewhere. So it would be the kid. Then ultimately, on down the road, it'd be me or whoever, and then it'd all fall apart. And There's a reason why and we're not winning, and yeah. they want to find the reason why. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure a whole bunch of that goes on today. Did you did you just get burned out on all of that and say screw it? I'm I done. did. The last last couple of deals I had were all on the West Coast, uh, and and I was building cars here, and they would come and get them or we'd ship them, and then I'd go out there and test today, and then long race weekends. We was doing the SRL, and uh, that that's a pretty strong series out mm-hmm. west, and and some other stuff. And it's pretty much what the Southwest Tour became. It's, yes, it's what the Southwest Tour was. Mm-hmm. And the talent, there's lots of talent out there, but there's lots of kids out there that are filthy rich through their parents that have no talent. And I was involved in that. Good people, but the kid has no talent. Mm-hmm. And his daddy just can't bite it. He just can't understand it. And I, last deal I had, I did it for three years. And at the end of that third year, they're already wanting to plan what they're doing the next year. And I'm like, I think I'm aged out. I'm, I'm just, I'm not doing this anymore because I like to win and at least think I got a chance. Right. And then got somebody else around. Like I helped Garrett Evans forever, built his cars and stuff. And there he was pushing sixties and could still win. You right. know, we could go to all the Washington tracks and stuff out there and win with him with the same stuff. And then 
then I had some young kids around here uh, during that time. I was helping uh, Harrison Burton. I was helping Kyle Benjamin, some other kids around, and mm-hmm. and we could win. And then because of money, I start going out there all the time, helping that crowd and and uh, limited talent couldn't win, and that's that's kind of what put me out of it. I gotcha. The, the uh, what uh, are there any of those young kids that are around now that do want to work on the cars or show an interest that that impresses you or you know that is a surprise or something refreshing for you to see oh, um well i'm not involved enough now to know if any of the kids want to work on them or not uh, right. i do go every now and then and, and watch were, were were there some ones that you caught your eye doing that when you were you know coaching no. or anything? not really? in the last not in the last good while no really no. okay no because I, I i you know i saw traces of that too because for you know over 10 years i was the pit reporter for the k&m pro series yeah. so you know i would see these these young kids climb out of the car and you know the first thing they do is grab the cell phone and you know they're doing this oh i've then broke I, I broke quite a few cell phones <laughs> in the pits yeah. have you really oh crushed them with a hammer oh, what happened i just I won't mention any names, but it, the first one, the, well, the first one had my wheel is Brian Scott. That's no secret. <laughs> I was helping him. We was, we was, we was running the. Uh, it was still the Hooters Pro Cup back then. When okay. We did that, and he shows up, and he's he's a big cell phoner, and I I wasn't mm-hmm. at all, and he's on that thing first thing, and I told him quite a few times, Brian, if you don't leave that cell phone alone, I'm going to end that cell phone for you. <laughs> and he gets out one day and we're, it's hot and we're going through aggravating time. And I take that sign, I'm going to lay it down, crush it with a hammer. <laughs> and, and that, and, and that one hit, and he'll talk about that. That one is respect. You know, when, when I did that, mm-hmm. and a couple other little things I'd, when I just pitch a fit about something, God, you know, I would have loved to have seen that. Get there. You get some, sometimes you got to do uh, unusual measures to get, attention or mm-hmm. respect or fear whichever one you want to call it right but when you know you're right about something and you're trying to teach a kid and they're being hard-headed you got to do what you got to do to get the point across <laughs> or you're going to keep getting beat that's great yeah oh god yeah, yeah. so anyway but yeah getting back to it <clears throat> uh, i'll use i'll use uh, uh someone like Corey lajoy or ryan priest as an example Corey lajoy uh, is a good example of a worker right because it, it, when i was in the k and pro series and he had you know his car that he was running the white zero seven car he would get out of the car and grab wrenches where yeah. some of these young kids get out of the car they grab their cell phone yeah and, and the same thing with ryan priest you know i would see a lot of that with you know these yeah. these young kids in the modifieds you know ryan could get out of the car and work on you know his own stuff right which i thought was really cool uh we need to in my opinion get back to more of that because if the kids did that more i don't think that they would drive the way they do you you know because nowadays these kids out there nowadays and you you may agree with me they've got talent but one issue that i'm seeing is that they can't pass without touching somebody yeah they don't try Mm -hmm. they don't try but I'm going to tell you, before we get off this subject totally, and I forget to throw this out there. Uh, so over the years, you know, I'd have to find different things along the way to kind of keep my interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, I guess that's the right word to say, to, to keep me wanting to go back and stuff. And so we were, we were out in California. It was at Bakersfield. And the night before the race, and I was with this group that I was just finished talking about that I was struggling with for a year before I left them. Uh, the night before the race, there was a whoever the sponsor was there had a big had a party and it was a, a barbecue and then beer and just uh, they had a band you know just to get together. Well, they had a uh, they had a uh, uh, 50 50 type drawing thing where you'd uh, you'd had to have a ticket to get in there and then they they drew and they gave away prizes. Well, they were giving away like a 35 inch screen TV, flat screen TV, mm-hmm. and they they draw this number out. Well, this kid over there goes crazy i mean ballistic he is he is happy you thought he'd won the daytona 500 twice jumping up and down high five and hugging everybody around him comes up grabs that tv he can't hardly carry it he's not big enough hardly to carry this thing in the box and he is smiles ear to ear and, and my wife who was there you know she says i like that so i don't know who that kid is but he's he's got something special to appreciate winning just a 50-50 drawing 35-inch screen TV like right. that right there. Well, mm-hmm. come to find out, it was Noah Gregson. <laughs> That's when we met Noah Gregson. Really? Yes. So since then, our interest in him has been a little different than a lot of people's is uh, because we like the way he is when he wins. 
Right. You know, he, he, he does. He celebrates. He yeah. appreciates. He does. He, he, appreciates. he definitely gets that. And so I would, I would like for younger people to be able to take a lesson from that because mm-hmm. I hate it. And I see it at Millbridge too. These kids win go-kart races. I don't care if it's the beginner stock, nothing, and you're five years old. If you win a race, appreciate it. Oh, yeah. And celebrate because mm-hmm. you may never win another one. And and uh, the satisfaction of outrunning people to me, that that was my main ever satisfaction. You know, winning, winning a race was it. That's right. what I lived for, did, sacrificed. And so is everybody else out there. Even the kids or somebody behind them, whatever. But somebody's putting a lot into every kind of racing there is. Mm-hmm. If you win a race, I want to see you be happy. Yeah, super if happy. If you're not, you need a life lesson. It's so funny. I, I I mean, I've raced enough in my, my career, but I think I have a grand total of maybe 10 wins in my entire life, and I cherish every single one of them. Oh. I have nowhere near as many wins. That you probably have wins you forgot about. So well, People uh, remind me, but I appreciate and have... Uh, give thanks every day and even I that's got to feel special like even the ones that you don't remember and someone yeah. reminds you of and you yeah. go i remember that night Heck yeah oh so yeah that's got to be really cool mm-hmm. so um anyway let, we're going to jump around a little bit your 1998 uh all pro championship mm-hmm. you were racing with some big heavy hitters back then i mean you had to deal with mike cope uh who else uh, uh ron young uh, bobby gill uh, bobby gill wayne and, anderson do you, who did you have any big rivalries with any of those guys in the in the in the series so uh yes because there was such talent you know mm-hmm. it, the, the, our whole really heavy touring stuff on asphalt started in about 95 we started going to Florida and racing a good bit because they had started that Hooters Pro Cup program. That's right. Which was super late models. Mm-hmm. So you'd go down there, you'd have Dick Anderson, and you'd have the Florida crowd, which was tough, always was. Plenty mm-hmm. of money, plenty of talent. David Rogers. David all Rogers. Guys. They all worked their butts off. Mm-hmm. They all were track heroes somewhere. But then the Hooters deal got together and brought all that crowd together at different tracks and paid 15000 to win for 200 laps. Wow. Well, the 200 lappers fit right right in my pocket because I'd been running a lot of 200 lap races and 400. We go down there, <clears throat> and we were lucky enough pretty quick to win. We went to uh, Lakeland. First time we went down there, we went to Lakeland. I win the race. Awesome track. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, just, yes. And <coughs> won, won the race at Lakeland, beat that crowd, and beat the Bobby Gill, who was a hero in, 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 in my mind the whole time. It was a great racer. In a car you built? No, no. He, okay. His own stuff or a lot of that stuff was frankie grill augie grill stuff you know back in the day okay uh but the car uh, that you were driving are you talking about the, the, the one you won uh, with no the car i was driving at that time was a hamkey car okay i got i'd ran how cars on asphalt up until about 93 or 4 and uh, then i got involved with robert hamkey and ran hamkey cars the rest of the time uh, man so you know it was a good marriage the whole time but anyway um uh, so in 97, uh, we decided we we're going to run the full Hooters Pro Cup deal. It paid paid a quarter of a million dollars to win the championship. All the races paid 15 grand to win, and then they paid money if you stayed in the points, and you could do good. Right. So we started chasing all that stuff. Well, by the middle of the season, I had like a 300-point lead. And we go to Jefferson, Georgia, and, uh, and uh, I, I crashed leading the race and lost 150 points of that lead. And then for the next couple of races after that, we, we struggled. And Who was chasing you into points? Uh, Bobby Gill. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and Billy Bigley out of Naples, Florida. Yeah. They were the two main ones I really had to beat. Now, there were lots of good racers, but those two guys, they were there to win. Hmm. And not that they all weren't, but they were the ones I really had to beat. So, anyway, we end up that year in 97, we lose the championship by one point. The last race at Lakeland. To Bobby? To Bobby. Oh. I'll win the race. He wins the championship by one point. He was driving for Terminal Trucking then. Mm-hmm. I had left Terminal Trucking. It was on our own. Uh, right, because so, you were friendly with the owner of the company, right? Yeah. Okay. Gene Eisenhower, great guy. Mm-hmm. Helped, a, helped a lot of people race. Mm-hmm. Uh, lots. So we d- we decide, we'd already decided in 97, the all-pro thing's looking pretty attractive. And I had some people wanting me to get involved in that. I'm getting older. If you're ever going to do anything in NASCAR, you need to take what you're good at right now, show them, and then tell into your career maybe you can get into something and, you know, do better. Mm-hmm. Well, so anyway, we built an all-pro car, and uh, 
and then 98 was just a stellar year i mean we we had a great year it was what eight wins i think that year right eight eight wins seven or eight poles the Uh, all-american 400 you won that right i mean like you dominated that race too i I won at 97 and 98 right back to back yeah but like Uh, the first year what was it uh the first year you led 272 yeah uh, to, uh out of 400 laps but then the second year you had to start 31st well what happened well, what was, happened uh, yeah <laughs> so we got uh, in practice we were on the game you know we're like this is this is a pole night and the car that went out before me was mike cope and he blows up <laughs> and they don't put a lot of they don't clean the track good so i go out there and i'm hanging on i don't make the race but i'm leading the points so i get the provisional and start in the back. And my goal was, I told everybody, I said, I'm going to lead the 100th lap. And I did. And so I lead the 100th lap, and then uh, throughout, you know, you got 16 tires or 20 then, I can't remember, so quite a few pit stops. Through pit stop sequences and stuff, I led a good while, and then you'd, you'd lose the lead again when you'd pit, and you'd come back out, and then they'd pit, and then you'd get the lead back or whatever. So there's like five to go. And this was at the beginning of some of my heavy-duty consulting I'd started doing in car building. Mm-hmm. I'd built Hank Parker Jr. car. And I was I was driver coaching and basically crew chief in Hank Parker Jr.'s deal. And they're there. So I'm running against him. Got the exact same thing I got. And with about inside of 10 to go, he's leading the race. And Ron Young and Wayne Anderson are fighting for second and third. I'm fourth. So we catch some lap cars. Hank makes a bad move, all three of us get by him. So now those two are leading and they're racing side by side and I'm behind them. Well, Nashville has got a really good groove and a half another one and other than that, that's about it. <laughs> so I, there's nowhere I can go. I'm, I'm going to finish third. Right. And we take the white flag and we come around and they go in the third turn and hit each other. And I get under them, come on, and win the race. That's how I won at 98. Awesome. Yeah. That's yeah, great. It was a great race. But, I mean, but look look at the talent, though, that was around back then. Like, oh, yeah. You know, like the, the Ron Youngs, the, the Mike Copes, uh, uh, and the Billy Bigleys. And these guys were all working on their own stuff, building, oh, yeah. building their own stuff and, and, anything, and all of that. What – um. What do you think that would help to try to get back to that? Or are we just, is that something we'll just never see again? I don't think you'll ever see it again. Yeah. You know, it's just, there's things that, like I said a minute ago, you got to go with the flow to keep your head up and survive in the world these days. But I just don't see, like, cars these days, you can't work on them. And the old cars, like my Chevelles in my barn that, that you can work on and stuff, kids don't have no interest in that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they might be. It might, maybe with electric vehicles like it used to amaze me to go to winchester and sail them both and the colleges up in there their engineers would build electric cars mm-hmm. back in the 90s right and then they would have a race every time we'd go up there to race and the deal would be they'd run 100 laps they could really go fast but they couldn't go fast 100 laps on the batteries so they'd have to figure it out exactly and i mean i've, I've seen them limp across the start finish line and win well, those, those, those kids had a different kind of skills than, than what I got and, uh-huh. or had, and they their, their world was different. Well, the world of all these kids today is different. And I, and I kind of, when NASCAR has gone to fuel injection and all the computers now and all that, I kind of see that being them catering to the youth base that we've got now. The, the few that are left that are interested in something concerning a car, uh-huh. that's that's – that's the avenues they go. They go through the. They, they live in the computer world. They live in everything digital. They live in the games, all that. So yeah. I think NASCAR has kind of plugged that in to what we're watching race on Sunday afternoon now. Yeah. So if we kind of step back from where I was and take a look at what's out there now and what's available and, and what kids are interest, interest, interested in, I think that's where it's at. Mm-hmm. So as bad as I hate it, I'm not. A, I'm not an EV fan at all but it's where it's going right and that's what's going to end up getting raced someday right so the the gearheads of today that's what they're going to be figuring out how to make go fast and go fast all day well you, you know what though it, it, I, my, my theory is though if you're a race car driver uh or you're a racer i i, I really don't think what's power in the car is going to matter too much i just want to make sure that i've got enough power i can beat you absolutely you know like yeah. if you have a, a gasoline engine i've got an electric motor and you know i've i've got enough power to be able to beat you i'm i'm cool with that and, yeah. I, and I think that we're going to get to a point where racers say 
I don't I don't care what's under the hood. I just want to be able to beat everyone. Well, they don't care now. You know, the, 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 the racers now, except for the few senior ones, uh, they don't care what's under the hood anyway. And, and in fact, who knows what's under the hood? Right. I mean, it's so regulated, and, and, uh, and they're all basically the same uh, to some degree. Uh, the the old the, the old you know I, I'm looking over here at your at your posters and stuff and, <laughs> and thinking back you know <clears throat> I can remember big time all the talk being about the motor you know the Ford right. versus Chevrolet versus Dodge I was there and 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 they basically I remember the seniors back in my when I was a kid they didn't pull for a driver they pull for a car right and and if the driver would leave that particular brand of car they wouldn't pull for him no more. <laughs> You, you know about all brand that. loyalty brand loyalty right. big time mm -hmm. so there's no brand loyalty anymore they all are basically the same They're, they keep trying with decals to make them some brand loyalty and they want to believe that there is but there's not mm -hmm. well the the i mean everything is evolving tech technologically yeah you know but the 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 mindset is still win right you know what i mean the the mindset get there first. Is, is yeah get there first the yeah. mindset is still the 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 game of that yeah uh moving on to another big late model race th that you won was the myrtle beach 400 oh right? yeah that was a great one now was that when that was when it was a a, a a super late model race it wasn't a late model stock race no it was a super late model race. actually it was an all pro race okay it was a uh it was a, a super late model race and the super late models like we raced at concord and all pro super late models were exactly the same mm -hmm. up until 1997 Okay. And then they went, uh, they made uh, the, the all pro NASCAR cars had to have door bars in the right hand side. Mm -hmm. Our super late models up till then were basically dirt cars, pretty much, mm -hmm. beefier, everything, and different bodies. But they were, that's what they were straight rails, no bars on the right, and all that. Mm -hmm. But then NASCAR and, uh, and the all pro series, after 97, you had to have door bars on the right. So it was a whole different car. Okay. They called it a perimeter car. Okay. Uh, but in 97, in 95 when we won that that 400 at myrtle beach uh you could run either okay uh we had we had basically a super light mall like we ran at concord that's what right. we had yeah because i saw you light up when i mentioned the myrtle beach 400 you oh said yeah that was a good one well, it was yeah, what made it so good well i had ran myrtle beach on dirt in fact i won the last dirt race at myrtle beach before they plowed it up and paved it you want to hear a funny story before we go any further i was at myrtle beach when it was dirt Back in 1978, my grandparents lived in Myrtle Beach, and we came down on vacation and discovered that they have a racetrack here in the area. Yeah. So me, my dad, and my brother went one night, and we went to a dirt track called Myrtle Beach Speedway. So yeah, yeah we, I went there when it was dirt. So that was it was, was a great wild. dirt track. So you and, won the last dirt race there. <clears throat> yeah, and okay. then and then I, when they paved it, we'd go down there occasionally, but they were a Saturday night racetrack, and so was Concord. And, and, and I, if they opened the gates at Concord, I ran there because Henry Fur always paid good money and I had a good chance to win, mm -hmm. uh, dirt and asphalt. So, but anyway, we started venturing out to Myrtle Beach. I'd have some Sunday afternoon races and stuff, and this is over a period of time, and I couldn't win. They had a guy down there by the name of Robert Powell, who was a, a outstanding late model racer for years. Mm -hmm. Couldn't beat him, finished second. Uh, and, and a couple others, lots of seconds. I don't remember anything but second <laughs> at, at Myrtle Beach. No wins. All the years would go down there. So they got this 400-lap race down there that paid. The year before they had it in 94, I guess it would have been, they, they had that race, 400-lap, paid good money. We didn't go. The next year, 95, kind of all that whole year, we, we're going to go. We're going to go to this. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> don't get me wrong. My car was good there. It just just – couldn't get the job done so about a week before the race we go down there we we rent the track for a day and um, we test all day long wear it out at the end of the day i'm no better than i was when i got there and and don't know why what what am i missing what why can't i get around here and so we're loading up an old guy that owned the racetrack at the time i'm trying to think of his name i can't he's gone now he he did everything at that racetrack mm -hmm. owned it ran it mowed the grass weed eated did everything and he's weeding around the infield fence while we're practicing about that whole day and we're loading up it's hot he and he comes walking up through the pits he says query i like you i said why is that and he said i don't know i just do he said i'm gonna tell you what you're doing wrong here i said what am i doing wrong and he said well it's the way you're getting in the first turn 
messes you up coming off the second turn. He said, there's a pit road over there, and you get about ready, got to run across it coming off too. He said, if you don't, the asphalt right above that's no good. He said, but what you're doing getting in and through the middle, he said, you about got to hit the fence on the bottom in the middle. And he said, they was, I was down there weeding uh, half the day, and he said, there was plenty of room between you and me. So I'm like, okay, if that's the case, then i got to turn better than I'm thinking I am because it's so war and slick. We're out and slick. All you think about down there is hooking up, hooking up, hooking mm-hmm. up. I'm like, I've been thinking wrong. i got to think about turning more. So we, we get about halfway home, and I tell the guys, let's go back. So we turn around and go back, spend the night, and have called them on the way, get up the next morning, and go back over and test. Well, I had to figure out a little something to do to make it turn better. But I started doing what he said, and I'm like, holy cow. I, I never saw that in following multiple people around here. Never figured it out. He told me. Could you feel it right away <clears> in the right car? Away. It didn't yeah. take me five laps. Really? Yeah. Okay. Now, after I did it, then I needed to make it turn even better to do what he was <laughs> saying. But I knew that's where I needed to be. Mm-hmm. So we did some A-frame changing and some stuff and get the car like, oh, this is it. And mm-hmm. we go back. Well, from the time we got there till the end of the race, I felt like I could win. But – my wife spotting for me there was a time the race ended up being between myself jeff purvis uh hal goodson i don't remember who else but we led a lot but about a hundred lap space there in the middle i didn't have any i didn't have a spotter no more and you're lapping cars every lap i mean there's a spotter works hard there Mm -hmm. well all of a sudden she isn't there I'm like, holy cow, what's going on? Well, finally, they tell me from the pits. They don't know what's happened, but they, they, she's not she's not talking. So I'm a little bit worried about that. But what had happened was where, where they sat in the bleachers, she dropped her radio all the way down to the bottom. Oh, no. And had to go down. This was your wife? This is my wife. Okay. Had to go down, get up under there, whatever, find it, and then get back up there. Well, we had about a 100-lap green flag run right there that I didn't have her. Oh, and then wow. when she came back on, she told me what happened, and then we ended up winning the race. So wow, that was a celebration too. No kidding. Oh, yeah, because you overcome a lot of diversity and, and all of that. A yeah. lot of adversity, not yeah. diversity. Uh, D- my, different my kind than you would there. think too. You know, <laughs> you, you never know. But uh, she did such a good job that whenever I didn't have her, I missed it. Uh, so. Well, I have to ask you because I was telling some other people that you came on, and uh, they were all drilling me. I have to ask you how real was the rivalry between you and Robbie Faggard? Well, there was no rivalry between me and Robbie Faggard. None? Uh, None. Mm. I mean, we had raced against each other on dirt. Right. Uh, We kind of, I mean, you know, he he was a threat, but he, if if I was on my game, he couldn't beat me, and I Mm. knew it, so all I had to do was just not mess up. Right. Uh, But you guys had had some run-ins, hadn't you? We'd had a few, but they were not of the nature that, people think they, okay. they weren't because of what was happening on the racetrack under green it's what was happening on the racetrack under caution and uh he had been instructed we won't go any further with names or by who but he wasn't driving his own car mm-hmm. and they couldn't beat me so he, he had been instructed under under caution run into my left front tire or whatever he could do to knock a fender loose do something cut a tire or something. cut a tire or something really keep me from winning Mm-hmm. So uh, that happened a couple times, and then I realized this this is intentionally happening mm-hmm. because he'd be like running fifth or sixth, and under caution come up and slam into the side of me or something. So the officials weren't calling him on it. Oh, uh, not really. They would okay. they would they were they would have been happy at the time too if I didn't win. You know, have, uh-huh. let's have a new winner. Oh, okay, it was one of those kind of situations. Kind of, yeah. Freddie's and, winning all the time. Yeah, and I you oh. know I, I lived with that. That's fine. Okay, I, mm-hmm. I am. And and I look at racing now. I don't I don't want to see the same guy win all the time. Mm. But if he's the best and they're working the hardest, I want them to win every race. Right. I don't have a problem with that. And we were. So, I confronted Robbie with it, and he's like, I'm, uh, "You're you're wrong. I'm not doing that. That you're the one's causing this problem." And then blah blah blah. And so, I, I think you maybe probably already know what ended up happening out of that. But after it did happen, I didn't have any more problems out of him. Okay. Well. It, Here's the, the the legend that I heard was that you bumped into him in a restaurant and you both got into a fight in the bathroom. Yeah. And uh, you had to basically take him behind a woodshed. 
Yeah. Is that what really is that really ha- what happened? That's what happened. No kidding. Okay. Yeah. So there is truth to the rumor. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So, all right. Because now, because we're debunking legends right now. So this is this is huge for, yeah. for this show. Yeah. Hey, and it, it's funny because uh, <laughs> I ended up I got arrested because of it, and we had to go to court. <laughs> and the judge he he's listening to what happened where and all. You, where did you run into him? Where was it? You were just a random restaurant? Shoney's in Concord okay used to be the deal that after every race at concord speedway majority of the racers ended up at shoney's Uh and a lot of times you'd party at the racetrack an hour or two before you'd leave and go to shoney's so Mm -hmm. he's in pretty good shape when you got there (laughs) and uh they had a big buffet it was a great time it was always a lot of fun but this particular night when this happened uh I, I had threatened him, and and I already told him I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tear up my race car tearing you up. I, mm-hmm. I can't afford it. Don't want to do the work. Right. So I'm gonna tear up your head. <laughs> so you stop, and he didn't. And we'd had an altercation that night. So I told him I'm gonna get you, but it ain't gonna be with my race car. So we get to Shoney's, and before I even get out of my truck, and I'm pulling the trailer, you know, I'm in the hollers, my wife and I, and my son, and a couple of others. And our group comes out and says, "Hey, he's in the bathroom." I said, "You need to go get him." So I did. <laughs> And they guarded the door. I went in, and that's a funny story because one Who of our— Who guarded the door, your crew? Well, not only not only my crew, but the other people. And and there was a fellow racer that was in there that stood up on a commode in another stall and heard all this. And so, anyway, I go in there, and we I, I, try, to, I try to talk to him, and he's, he's just bullheaded at the time. And so he ended up—he got the worst end of the deal— <laughs> And so oh, no. I get arrested. We go to court. And judge, he's like, I, just, I really don't know what to do about this. And he said, uh, it's kind of kind of an unusual case. He said, but I got to do something because you, you can't be beating up on that man anymore. He's telling me that. And I'm like, well, as far as I'm concerned, it's over with. As long as he be, does what he's supposed to do, then it ain't going to happen anymore. And he said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you on probation for a year. And he says, uh, the contingencies of it are is uh, you can't hit him in the head anymore for a year. <laughs> like okay but could you but you could hit him on the racetrack well i could have but we raced perfect after that that was the end of the year the last race around thanksgiving okay and then a couple of weeks before christmas i get a phone call and it's him mm-hmm. and i see it on my caller id and i'm like well what's this gonna be about and he invites me to his christmas party really and uh, we go okay and we've been good friends ever since okay as you guys have made up oh yeah all right we've raced a lot since then that's cool because i had yeah. met robbie is he still racing legend cars yeah and i bumped into him a couple of years ago out there it just you know he was my interaction with it was always pleasant but uh yeah i had heard that guys had had run-ins with him on the track yeah and, and all that what year was this uh was all this going on mm, that would have been uh that was that was early nineties. That's okay. before we did any all pro racing. Okay, and kind okay. of stepped out. So, you so know, okay, this one was you, running there every week. You you realize that you are just you just made a whole bunch of people that are going to watch this episode just chomp at the bit loving this story because <laughs> it, it's been. Well, I'm not proud of it. You know, I, <laughs> I, I did other things I we wasn't proud stuff of. We're not proud of. No, absolutely. Um, but it's what had to be done because right. racing was my life, and uh, and every dollar that I had to spend unnecessarily was money i could have spent on something else right so i looked at i looked at all the you know when people would do things uncalled for or whatever i, I got mad about that right but now if you tear me up we're racing hard and we just both losing and crash hey you're my best buddy we was both going for it okay so well one of, yeah one of the things that i had always admired too is that like <clears throat> you didn't have a huge budget or anything like that because you there were guys that were showing up with you know 18 wheeler stackers oh, yeah. and all that and you had your just regular enclosed trailer yeah uh you know most of your budget went to the car and you just kicked everyone's ass with hard work and homework is that's what i had gathered i mean i had gotten a chance to watch you uh, not <clears throat> in the early earlier stages of your career but you know in the early 2000s uh so that was what i had seen is that you know this isn't some guy that's showing up with a big budget and big crew and and all that He's, no regular truck and trailer and it it puts a different perspective on everything when you're when you have to do it like that Mm -hmm. and so i tried to take that and put it in these kids that i helped for years Mm -hmm. uh, because like jack sprague and i good buddies now we talk about it all the time we we had to take what we won saturday night and use most of it to go back the next saturday night Mm -hmm. so you're racing with a whole different need for the sport Mm -hmm. well that's a lot what's missing right now these kids that wreck now, it doesn't matter if they're in go-karts or in NASCAR Cup Series. When they wreck and walk away from it and don't have any feelings about what happened, what's going to take to get back next week, all that, 
Uh, that's that's I, I don't like that. The respect for do you think the respect for what goes into it disappears? The respect for what goes into it, the equipment, the money, the people involved. Mm-hmm. You know, if as you know, people who work on race teams, any of them, they give up a lot for that. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot a lot of them are well paid today. That's that's great. But even though they're well paid, they're still giving up a life that they would have. Right. Now, it's the life they chose, like I did. I chose it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I either chose it or got addicted to it, and, and there was no cure for it. <laughs> I say that a lot. But uh, You know, like, talking about uh, someone like Jack Sprague, uh, you know, obviously you guys have raced together for years. Yep. Uh, you know, he, you had beaten him. He had beaten you. Uh, why was it that he was able to get those breaks to get um, – move on to the truck series and eventually up the nascar ladder and you didn't uh, was oh. was there money involved did he have more sponsorship no no, no. money was definitely not it his uh, work ethics were great mm-hmm. he was younger he's 12 years younger than i am okay so at that time uh if you were talented and 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 showed it and and could and and had a clue what it took to make it go fast uh you were desirable mm-hmm. and uh he 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 he, he worked for robert hamke and Hamke was instrumental in the in the beginning stages. Uh, some, not really, not really what Robert uh, money wise or anything, but the people that were surrounding him, he got involved with. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of those people that had uh, some stuff going on to get him out there. Okay. And he's extremely talented. Has no fear. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and these kids today don't have any fear, but they don't know what to do when they get on the other side of uh, the security of the, a car. Jack did. Jack can handle it real good on the fence and right past it. In other words, when it's out to lunch, you mean, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not only that, but just driving it past the edge. Mm-hmm. Like I'll say Kyle Bush and, and some of these guys that can, they stay on the they stay on the other side of the edge comfortably. Mm-hmm. Jack does that real well. Okay. And not only in go-karts. I mean. He, and, and, he's and racing go-karts, He's too. racing go-karts, too. But, but in anything <laughs> he say, gets in. What is in, he doing lately? He's uh, racing go-karts, too. That's what he's, we're all in together. Up at Starnes Farm? Yeah. We got, I got to come check this place out yeah. sometimes. That's yeah. got to be fun to watch. But he in the trucks, you know, it, it showed that he could do that, and, and anything else he ever got in, he just he's he's mm-hmm. comfortable on the other side of the edge. Do and, you uh, do you think that's what kind of hindered your NASCAR career? Is that you kind of went after it a little too late in oh, life? Yeah. Yeah. I got told it a million times, and I did, and then and then then it got to the point to where you had to, like you go, you could take your resume, and it's like second to none. They want to know how much money you're bringing, right. and and I got uh, that's I heard that way till I got tired of it. Right. In fact, I did quit late model racing one time and went after a bush opportunity and then some truck stuff and it just it, I couldn't get in the stuff to be able to showcase anything and right because I remember looking at some stats like you had made attempts in Cup Xfinity and trucks but yeah. did, uh, didn't qualify for the races no. there, right just no. underfunded teams underfunded teams undermanned. Mm-hmm. just just some people wanting to do it and had just enough to get there and you know we tried to make that uh, in 99 we tried to do some bush stuff and they would be like 60 65 cars showing up every race wow. and uh, we had fords and the only ford really running good was mark martin at the time you had to have the right rouse stuff mm-hmm. uh, just 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 different things and I, did, I really never got enough experience in all that to get comfortable in it like i was in a late mall right and mm-hmm. uh Oh well, so, yeah. right. It, but it's it was fun, and now you're now you're living your best life right now. Absolutely, having fun in the go karts. Well, yeah. listen, uh, we we ask this of every guest that comes on it is we hope you had fun, and would you yeah. come back and do it again? Oh you, yeah, you know because Absolutely. I'm sure there's millions of other stories that you 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 have from other, over the years. Yeah, that, that could fill hours and hours. But we definitely want to thank you for coming on the show today and and for joining us and sharing this time with us. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it, and. Uh, there are definitely thousands of stories uh, <laughs> out there, and uh, we, we've hit on some big ones, but uh, there's there's lots more. Well, we're definitely going to share some other ones. Okay. Very cool. Thank you. Freddie Query joins us on the Derek Prentice-Siglio Show. What a great time we've had with him. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you the next time. Bye. Bye.